A very warm welcome to tonight's LaSalle Public Lecture Series. An evening with Karim Rashid. Now, first off, we would like to have um, Professor Steve Dixon, President of LaSalle College of the Arts, to say a few words. Professor Steve Dixon, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to the Sound Public Lecture Series an evening with Karim Rashid. Now, it's been said that great design is a language, not a style. And Karim has devised a language all of his own. Working across and betwixt every conceivable field of design, he's a true auteur and an original, whose work is always distinctive, or always distinctive and recognizably his. It's epitomized by futuristic concepts and eye-opening ideas, expressive lines, richly vivid colors, eloquent shapes, and sensual, erotic curves. He not only creates iconic designs, but real experiences and somatic sensorium. Now his approach is radical and uncompromising, and he's not merely a great designer, but has developed a unique philosophy of design. He's published six books on the subject, including the provocatively titled, I Want to Change the World. His philosophy encompasses a range of impulses and ideas from a rejection of rules and of nostalgia in favor of a propulsion towards the new and the future, to envisioning distinct concepts, including what he calls sensual minimalism and democratic design, which I'm sure we'll hear more about tonight. Among his most celebrated designs are the Garbo, a voluptuously shaped waste paper bin which has sold millions worldwide. The O-Chair for Umbra, a concept store for Giorgio Armani, perfume bottles for Kenzo, tableware for Alessi, an elliptical pink champagne cooler for Verve Cricot, and a dazzling array of lighting products. He's received commissions from some of the world's most successful and glamorous companies, including Audi, Toyota, Sony, Estee Lauder, and Prada, and this year created a stunning range of aluminium bottles for the drinks brand Pepsi. Recently, too, he's been designing several real estate developments in New York and a multi-million dollar holiday resort in Mexico. These add to his impressive record of over 50 buildings and interiors projects, from restaurants and retail to residential, with 2.5 million square feet built in 32 cities on six continents. Other extraordinary career statistics include more than 3,000 original designs in production and 300 awards. They include the Red Dot Design Award, the Pent Award, the George Nelson Award, and Canadian Designer of the Year. Kareem's work is featured in 20 permanent collections in art galleries, including the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Centre Georges Pompidou in Paris, and the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Kareem has been variously described by publications including Time Magazine, Esquire, GQ, and The Guardian as, and I quote, the most famous industrial designer in all the Americas, an alien who has subverted the rules of design, a king of magazine covers and glamour in New York, and a superhero who has saved Americans from bad design. Mm. Now, as if that isn't already cool enough, Somehow he miraculously convinced us that pink could be manly, and what's more, pink could be the black. And in his spare time, he's a DJ and designs his own tattoos. We're delighted to have Karim here at La Salle, where yesterday he conducted a remarkable masterclass with students and undertook in-depth discussions with staff on the philosophy of design. Among all his other achievements, he's an accomplished and experienced lecturer including teaching at the beginning of his career at the Pratt Institute in New York, who have since awarded him an honorary doctorate. He's an inspiring figure, and he himself has written eloquently about the nature of inspiration. I quote, I look way beyond design and inspiration is a everything can be a stimulus. 
I'm inspired by my childhood, my education, by all the teachers I ever had, by every city I have traveled to, by every book I have read, by every factory I ever toured, every smell, taste, sight, sound, and feeling. He's a perpetual optimist and visionary, a futurist creating the future, and a designer who is truly an artist. Ladies and gentlemen, we please give a very warm welcome to Karim Rashid. Thank you. Um, I have to say that was the most beautiful introduction anybody has ever done. I mean, and also, it just exhausted me. <laughs> so now that I've done all that, I'm tired and boring. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so. Uh, we can start the images. Uh, first, uh, I'll say that I'm thrilled to be here in the South. It's, it's an actually beautiful school. I think that uh, students are fortunate to have such a, an amazing campus and an amazing faculty because we had a really rigorous and uh, beautiful discussion for hours last night. Uh, so you have the best, I think. And I've been to a lot of schools in the world. Uh, I, I will say that. Uh, that the subject of design, uh, which is something very close to me, uh, started, I'll just tell you very briefly, it started when I was five years old. Uh, why? Because I was on a ship going from London to Canada, to Montreal, and there was a drawing competition. There was about maybe six, seven thousand people on the ship, three, four hundred children. And the drawing competition, uh, I sat down to draw, and I was thinking, what on earth am I going to draw? And I looked at this uh, child on my left, child on my right and everybody was drawing the ship and or their family holding hands or the sun. Now something really went wrong in my genetic makeup because I decided to draw luggage. And and I drew luggage because I was obsessed not obsessed, I was kind of shocked and inspired by this idea that we took our entire small apartment in London and put it in a few crates and a few suitcases to go and leave and go to another country. So that level of organization, how you put everything in those cases and all that, I started to draw, opened up like little stacks of shirts of my father's and, and shoes of my mother's and I made these strange distorted isonometrics of, uh, of my parents' things. And uh, what, what, uh, why I remember that, well, well, I won the competition by the way. <laughs> That was my first award. That's why when you read my little, like I won 300 awards, remember my first one was when I, I drew the luggage. So, uh, but why design is, a, is, a, is, is kind of an interesting phenomenon because, you know, going back, and I will go back to when I was uh, in university, let's say, if a person walked up on the street to somebody and said, you three design. And my process was in New York did exactly this about in the 90s, actually. But I thought about this in the 70s when I was just starting university. They said, usually they made fashion. fashion. So then you have to say, oh, I'm an industrial designer, a product designer, an interior designer, or an interior architect, or all that other thing. Uh, but we were, we're, us, we shape, we as designers, we shape human experience. We don't really necessarily shape things, we shape experience. We the age because UX and UI designers are doing this exact same thing without doing something physical, obviously. So we're shaping kind of the human. And if we focus more on that as designers, I think the world will be far more, far more seamless place and a, a nice place to kind of navigate and move from A to B. And it would be more inspiring and more uplifting and more human, I think. But there's a tendency that we focus in design on the aesthetic of the thing, of the object, the archetype, the building, the camera, the shoes, the chair. And we tend to isolate that. We pull that away from us as human beings. And in fact, if you kind of analyze product photography since the 1950s, since the days of Raymond Lowy, or George Nelson or Charles Mead. Rarely are the pictures of people with these products. And we put these products on some sort of pedestal and we look at them objectively as a piece of art or something else. 
which by the way, just to, just to add to that, design is the heart. It's never been art, it shouldn't be art, because design is a social act. And why I say that is because if we're shaping human experiences, then we're shaping society. And in fact, the word design, which I was just saying about calling designers, came from the Dutch Revolution, from the Germans, the program. And the program is to basically have criteria, you have a list of criteria, and then you try to find solutions for that criteria. So criteria can be, for example, you know, uh, process that you have to use, the material that you're using, the technology necessarily, or maybe that you're using, a new social behavior, for example, maybe you should try to share called a slouch chair, because a lot of people slouch. We don't really sit the way we used to sit. If you look at Henry Dreyfus' um, ergonomics uh, from the 1950s up, people use those things as a Bible and would build chairs until today where the angles are actually not really uh, accurate or proportionate to us. Even if you've analyzed, I just stayed in uh, Denmark in a hotel at, uh, at uh, Arne Jacobson design, and they kept one room in the hotel, Radisson. It's exactly the hotel, the room from 1954. So I went in, I spent the night in the room, and it was like a real pleasure because apparently it's very hard to get this room, so I was honored. I was going to, everything was small and low, and the ceiling was low. It was very strange, you know, because this is really, and we're, we've all literally, in a very short period of time, grown. Just like every young person I know is taller than their parents. So things are kind of evolving and changing, but there's a tendency in design that we're not really, most of the time, focusing on us. We're sort of focusing on, I would say, almost a kind of visual exercise. And this is kind of prolific right now in architecture. We're seeing architecture buildings that are designed as objects, as products, really, on a screen that haven't really dwelled deeply into the innate issues and properties and needs of architecture. That if I design space, I have to think about space. And each space has a program. For a specific program, what we tend to do now, and I've seen this, is that you design a very cool object, and then you're kind of moving in there and then trying to set up the program, rather than vice versa. Hence why a lot of times the interior and exterior of a lot of beautiful architecture is not really in sync or in synchronization because we're not thinking uh, deeply about the kind of social aspects. We're thinking much more on an aesthetic level. Now, and I was a culprit of this. I did a lot of this stuff. Back in the 80s, I was like, you know, doing things that were strictly, I would say, argue aesthetic. I wasn't really deeply thinking about the experience that was coming from the And in fact, Going back 125 years ago, when, when we made beautiful machines that could actually make things in, a, in, in speed and make things inexpensively, we created design products that were for a large audience, inexpensive for a large audience, i.e. democratic design. So design was always a notion of social, it was democratic. It was supposed to reach a really large audience. But then, you know, I think something went, went, or there was a bifurcation that took place. Industry is starting to produce goods at such hyper rate, and they are now. We're kind of like saturating the world with, with goods, regardless of the designer, by the way. I, you know, I have this argument because a lot of people say, oh, you know, you're a designer, well, you're contributing to all kind of consumers, consumption, et cetera. Sure, I'm contributing to it, but you know what I'm doing with it? I'm trying to make it better. Because the companies will produce the goods regardless, with or without the goods. So we come in as a kind of humanizer. I always say that design is really humanizes, whether it be a space or object or clothing or anything, because we're the ones who sort of, let's say, take the, the developer's precept or concept or the manufacturer, what they want to make, and we're more in touch with social life, with everyday, with people, to try to humanize the industrial product. Um, so, you know, it, it is, so I, I, that's the first issue I think it's very important to like, consider is, is that to think a little more, more externally. I said this yesterday, I'm going to repeat it, I don't know if there's anybody watching my lectures that I said yesterday, but I, I talked about this notion of, of being um, selfish versus selfless. Artists? Selfish. I hope I'm not criticizing any artists out there, but <laughs> if you're out there, you're selfish. Why? I wake up in the morning, I go to my studio at 9 o'clock, I do whatever. Think about it. 
And then you hope there's a market for it or hope a gallery will take it on. But it's you, deep in your, your gut, your DNA. A lot of times art is a very emotional experience. It's like, oh, I'm angst. I'm gonna paint with oil a really angry painting, like Francis Bacon, who was bipolar and had all these issues. So he painted, he, there was a phenomenal darkness in the work, very successful, beautiful work. But as a designer, okay, you go to the office at nine in the morning and you've got this criteria. A company has asked you to design a refrigerator, LG, for example, I did a refrigerator. You know what that's like to design a refrigerator? The first thing is, it's a box. It's like designing a storage cabinet. So there's not a lot to do there, but there is. There is, if you step back and think about very simply the human experience of the interaction with the refrigerator. But you know what a lot of designers do? They start thinking about the facade of the refrigerator like an architect thinks about the facade of a building. It's completely removed from the experience. So sure, you could find a new material for that refrigerator on the outside, you could do something slick or something, or maybe you worry about the handle a little bit, or hiding the handle or whatever. But the reality is, you know my first thought was of the refrigerator? Everybody in the world complains of the same thing, because the matrix of the kitchen, by the way, is all set up with all of these components globally. It's like a standard. It's almost like the German DIN standard. You know, where German DIN standard is, for example, an office chair has to have five legs, which is ridiculous, by the way. Somebody should design an office chair with 10 legs, because that's more stable than five, isn't it? So, or eight would be better, call it octopus. Anyway, so you have a refrigerator. My first thought was, you know, the back of the refrigerator, I struggled with the back of the refrigerator. In my office, you should see what ends up at the back of the refrigerator. It's disgusting. You know, and I have to sit there, imagine, with 30 people in New York and say to them, you know, you gotta clean up the refrigerator every once in a while. I went down there and I was just shocked, right? So not, don't have a back of the refrigerator. Get rid of it. So instead of making a 60 centimeter deep refrigerator, make a 30 centimeter, so everything stays up front. Flat, thin. When I did that, I happened to be designing a kitchen at the same time for Scavolini, and so I proposed to them a flat kitchen. So the whole kitchen is only 32 or 35 centimeters deep. The cupboards are only that deep, so you can't have the storage way back there either. The plates then fit perfectly, and the whole kitchen is flatter. When the whole kitchen is flatter, you just gain in your home another 30, 35, 40 centimeters, et cetera, right? So that's design. Or let's say, put it this way, that's the point of entry into design. That's where you can start to do something interesting or something original because you step back, you looked objectively, and I'm not joking when I say this, by the way. Every morning when I wake up, I pretend I don't belong to this planet. And I even tell my little three-year-old daughter this. Right? She thinks I'm pretending that I'm a superhero or something. But I'm telling her to look at the world, not as everybody else sees it, because that's the beauty of our children, but actually do see the world not as everybody sees it, right? Is to forget about what you know. Forget about this world that you were put into, that you were asked to accept, that you were asked to decide that this is the way one must live. I think about maybe changing the paradigm. Now, not changing the paradigm for the sake of it, but changing it because it needs to get better. Think about this. Sports car. I'm at a hotel and what drives up the front is a Ferrari. Yeah. Little flat orange Ferrari. This friend of mine is here and I went to pick me up at the airport. I couldn't even get in the car. Frank, I'm not criticizing Ferrari. I don't want it. But it's absurd. Right? In this day and age, as we know, because the first electric car model was designed in 1934 or something of that nature, these cars are kind of they're not in sync with the time in which we live. Comfort is absurd because it's awkward. Now, you know, Citroën was a car in 1964, which was from the driver's seat to the car. And when you get out of the car, the, the seat rotates and you get out. What happened to that? 1967, the trend started to stop producing. Nobody has done it since. 
The reason nobody's had the sense is because if you go buy yourself in a car and you decide, oh, I'm going to go to like luxury market and go to Hollywood and you sit there and get in front of the car, the car looks like the 1980s and it looks like the extension of one's living room. Still leather details, still little trim, so all these semantics that mean nothing in the time and world in which we live. Nothing. This stuff is irrelevant. And why is it irrelevant? Because the big change and the big schism that's happened in 50,000 years of Homo sapiens is the digital age came along and it's broken the chain of analog that we actually got to a point where as much as we believe and feel that history is of a critical importance, all of a sudden the digital age comes about and boom, history is irrelevant. In the digital age, history is irrelevant. It's hard to sign an app Designing an app, programming, etc., has nothing to do with the last 50,000 years of humanity. The digital age of you having a kind of social network of hundreds of friends, connectivity, borderless world, seamless world, uh, how can I say, easier and simpler experiences never existed before in humanity, never. The digital age takes so little energy. The analog world took so much energy. And the analog world in the last 175 years depleted the Earth of its resources. And we have created a toxic world. And not to get into a kind of, uh, a kind of depressing subject, but Last week I read that one out of four Western Europeans and Americans get cancer. Now, it's pretty strange. Why? It's obvious. We have a lot of work around us. And here we go as designers. And we're supposed to shape a better world. Well, then that's something that we should, we should talk about. And I remember coming to a company when, when, uh, when uh, the old chair was mentioned in 1996 or 97. I came to this company and I started designing this chair for them. And I talked about using polypropylene as a product because it's lightweight, it's inexpensive, it's 100% recyclable, you can recycle it forever. And at that time, the company had products in their um, SKUs and their catalog. A lot of them were really toxic and you know, made of PVC and other polymers were dangerous. So, you know, I, here I was as a consultant, I was asked to actually design a product. I wasn't thinking product first, I was thinking, I need to design something that's better for the earth, and actually better for this company, and in turn, if I do something successful, maybe I can take out of their catalog 20 products, maybe my one product could replace 20. And I always had started to have that as an agenda as an industrial designer, I thought, for every product I put on the market, I should be able to take away three, addition by subtraction. is the larger agenda of shaping a better world, which is the design of the design. That's what the design should be doing. If we focus on the image only, firstly, it's uninspiring, even though people think they're being inspired. You design a chair, if you look tomorrow at 200 chairs, you will not design an original chair. In fact, you won't do anything original if you just focus on the specific archetype that you're working on. If you're going to design a museum, look at 200 museums around the world, there's a good chance you'll be somewhat derivative of those museums. So where do you get inspired by? How can you be inspired? And why should you be inspired? Well, if you're going to design something, or I'm going to design something, hopefully, genetically, we do something very different from each other, first of all. So it's an extension of our original thought and our original being. That's number one. Number two is on an intellectual level, is maybe I'm looking at the project or the, the, yeah, the project in a very different way than, than you are. And in turn, we would do different work again. But we need to be inspired by other things. We need to be inspired by the broader human condition. What's the broader human condition? 
know, when I look at the world, when I move and navigate around the world, I can't help but think that the majority of it is really ill-considered and not really designed. And I always thought that maybe what design should start off doing, even before it gets too inspiring or too artistic or too creative, maybe it should just start to clean up the world. Rid the world of uh, uh, encumbrances. Or as John John Cotillard used to say, the philosopher from Patrick used to say something like that objects are obstacles in daily life. Imagine if you think of it as obstacles. To give you a good example of an obstacle, you walk into an airport and you're disoriented. You don't even you can't really not, not sure where the gate is. You're trying to find the gate. You push through some strange lots of duty free. Finally, you kind of get to a space where you start to see some signage. And graphic designers, for example, for many, many years, they've worked on signage. These are these, there are a lot of these projects, or how can I say, these so-called problems that you have, and there's a lot of them, have been resolved. Many years ago, I said something that a journalist really got upset with me about. I said that we've resolved all the world's problems. And in fact, design is not about solving problems. It's about creating more inspired, more interested human experiences. They were very upset. Oh, what do you mean you solve all those problems? Like this problem, or that problem. But the thing is, what I mean by that is that we we know the answers already. We know how to make a self-sustainable building. Elon Musk re released a couple of days ago a, a a solar panel roof. This can be reconfigurable for any roof. It's not like you're adding solar panels to a roof. It's an existing roof. Beautiful solution. We've solved a lot of these problems. We know solar for 190 years now. We know actually dwelling. 3,000 years ago, people were making dwellings that could keep cool in hot weather. So we've gone through a lot of these things. When we speak about sustainability, we know the answers. We just got to turn around and apply them. So that's where design is the social act. Now let's talk about the creative act. Which I talked about a little bit, how one can be inspired. One can be inspired by just watching and observing social media. Just watching the way people live, what they do, what they do, or how they engage. Interesting thing about design, I always find this is fascinating, is that you can use yourself. You are the experiment. Right. And I'm amazed actually, and I'm, I'm in, and this is very honest, traveling the world, especially with students, but with professionals where they don't do some very simple exercises to resolve an issue or problem. You go to a restaurant, you get into a booth, and you realize the table is there. You know, and it's all because it's rigid, it's a booth, and the restaurant is not where it should be. Just off in scale, because somebody it wasn't rigorous enough to even make a quick mock-up, try it themselves to resolve the problem. Now, creativity is an amazing thing. We are here to create. I just wanna, I wanna say this, I'm a big believer in this. The only reason we exist, is here, this is the answer for our existence. I create, therefore I am. And I can create two ways. Well, I can, a woman can. Procreate, keep the human race surviving. Intellectually create, to evolve and progress the human race. We do one or the other. Some people do neither. But the, all of us are capable of intellectually doing something creative in this world that's contributive. Every one of us are different. We all have different fingerprints, which by the way, in the digital age, that's all we should have. We don't need anything else. Um, you know, it's amazing. I am so scared traveling to 127 countries that I have a stupid little book with rubber stamps in it. 
It's an absurd idea that I, I have to be so concerned about this. To get in the hotel and put it in a safe, or I leave it at the front desk initially, they have this weird idea, maybe you gotta keep it overnight, I have no idea why. Maybe they make a copy. Um, strange, huh? You know the rubber stamp technology, the idea? From 800 years old. Money, coins, you know how old coins are? Years old. And I'm walking around with coins in my pocket, and I'm just a little bit. So I get all this change. Every time I handed somebody a bill, I just got coins. I was like, oh, when do I get a bill back? So I got all these coins. Coins, full of bacteria and germs, passing around coals to everybody. Seriously. Bills, paper, paper, so it's money. Yet in the digital age, do you know 70% of the world's money doesn't move, that isn't specific anymore? All the trade that's happening, between the stock exchanges, between banks, it's all digital. There's no more Fort Knox with a bunch of gold bullion. There's no need for the bank. Banks are hanging on to that archetype to no end. They feel they need some sort of physical presence. They don't need a physical presence. It's over. The credit card, it's over. You don't need that thing. The lock on the door. Over. Keys. Over. This is not the future. This is now. So the digital age, you extract all this stuff. What a better life. Isn't it? I would love that. I'd love to just travel the world and just use my fingerprint. Because for 12 years at my gym in New York, I used my fingerprint to go into the gym. I used my fingerprint to weigh myself and get my Body mass index. My finger. So what? This is a gym. <laughs> Think about it. Singapore, by the way, you guys have real trouble with taxes. Unbelievable. <laughs> Nobody wants to take a credit card. Then when they take a credit card, they only take. Oh, I only take Mastercard. Then I get the other one. Oh, I only take Amex. I have no idea what the taxi business is about. <laughs> but I want to use my fingerprint. So it's kind of. I, I think about this perpetual, this sense of seamlessness. Create about. Since you're creative and you're capable of creating, and if we all create, we're, there's no such a thing really as creators or artists, and then there's everybody else. You know, people say to me, they say, oh, I'm not creative. It's not true. Of course you're creative. You just haven't maybe pushed or rigorously, uh, how can I say, um, it's, uh, you haven't been encouraged to create. You haven't been put in a profession or a place or a thing or your parents didn't really push you in that direction, but we're all creative. So if you're a surgeon, for example, you're kind of an, if you're an artist slash surgeon, you invent a new way of doing surgery. That's a creative act, right? If you're an engineer and you manage to be one of the crew of the 3,000 engineers, by the way, that did the A380, amazing. You know, when you go on that plane, if you're one of those engineers, you're, that's a creative act. Right? And now we're all actually being empowered with our, not only is digital age empowering our individuality, it's empowering creativity. Because every one of us now, with the simplest software, with free software, with an app, can make music. We're all become photographers. We've all become, we all go in the dark room and edit photographs. It's amazing. You know, 40 years ago, one person out of 100 had a camera around their neck. And we all have cameras. This is creative. It may be kind of very simple, and it's on a very surface level, but it's still part of the kind of beginning that the digital age is affording us, this notion of really shaping and designing our own world in a way. And actually in the digital age, what's interesting is, is that you can customize it so much, like I can customize my pronation of my running shoe to run, I can customize my cosmetics or my shampoos online, I can even now do customized clothes where my body gets scanned clothes to fit me perfectly, et cetera, et cetera. This is the new digital age, which is kind of subject of variance, that there's the opportunity to vary everything in your life, to shape your own life. Whereas in the physical world, the analog world, the back of the old world, everything was static. You were handed something. You were S or M or L. There was no customization. Going way, way back, imagine this. 
when they used to make a Rolls Royce? 80 years ago, 70 years ago, 60 years ago. It was something like 40 men in three months to make one car. And it was a lot of customization, because everything was done by hand. And when things are done by hand, you can customize to no end. But then when the Industrial Revolution really was in place, and robotics came in place, and especially CAD, and automation, there was no variance in anything. The car industry went from doing very customized cars all the way to, oh, here's your car, everything is fixed. The Nissan, gray, white, black, interior is beige, gray, done. Strange, because we live in a robotic world where cars, like the pieces where we're being even put on, are by robotic arms. So you could easily have that robotic arm grab a different piece. Like, you should be able to go to your laptop and say, oh, I want to buy a car. And you can choose one, any of 1.6 million colors. And then if you press the button, the car goes into a little spray booth. There's 160 little spray guns, just like a bubble jet tank. And it comes out of your car. That level of kind of, that's just the beginning of this notion of individualism or our customation, custom automation is happening, but it's just starting to happen. Because we're only at the beginning of the digital age. Remember this, by the way. The analog age is 50,000 years old, the digital age is 40. But it's not just the beginning. We are the pioneers. Pioneers. We are the pioneers of the digital age. In fact, most of you are kind of like on this cusp, where you may have, some of you may have, you know, you're on partly on the analog, partly in the digital. But what happens 100 years from now when we're all digital? We're all digital, the world will be very dematerialized. And we're losing a lot of the material now, because why? Can I design a product, a chair, a space, a building that can compete with the ad infinitum variable kinetic possibilities of the digital age? Probably not. Hence why we make a building that's all full of LED, like the buildings you have here in Singapore, that at night is like this perpetual, beautiful extraction of light and color going on. Because that's a way of, of connecting, let's say, something that's static, heavy architecture with this amazing, ethereal, kaleidoscopical, colorful digital age. Now, why, why do you want to make something original? Well, very simple, because you're one of 6.7 billion people. That's enough to drive you to do something original. And you're one of over 1 trillion people that have ever existed in humanity. And I had, for the first time yesterday, I said a really good joke, and I'll say it again. Heaven must be really cold. Right? In serious density. Hell is probably even fuller. <laughs> so, trillion people, souls, minds, went, went through this earth, and here you are today, and you have an opportunity while you're alive, while you're here, to put pencil to paper, finger to iPad, whatever it takes to do something original. And how are you going to do something original? I think by focusing on the subject. Sub subject. Form, I think, fall, should follow subject. What is the subject? I'm going to go for it. Focus on the subject. Not on the form, not on the visual, not on the style. Style is a nasty thing. You know why? It's superficial. In out. Last 10 years in the interior design world, it was all a kind of revivalism of some sort of strange Baroque. It was like a joke. It was embarrassing. You know, you walk into a lobby now of some building and you see some this baroque chandelier. It's kind of like you made a mistake. It was style. The space was style. It's like being a, a theater designer, a set designer. You, you know, when you're a set designer, you're going to tear down the set. Do it, shoot the film, tear the set down. So we start to make all the pieces that were appearing to be theater or history. It's all kitsch, it has nothing to do with the world we live in. Absolutely. So that's, that passes, and then some other little bit of revival, mid century modernism revival comes around. Next thing you know, it's all you need. It's a moment. And it's easy. 
I mentioned you as a, as, a, as a designer, it's so easy to look into the past and appropriate. It's so easy to be derivative. It's very hard to be original. Forget the past. I am a huge believer that the past is a burden on creativity. That the past, the stories of history, which by the way, it's all distorted anyway. It's unbelievably distorted. The French call history l'histoire, the story. It could be fiction. Somehow we believe it was a reality. What's reality? This. Now, and as Eckhart Tolke said, here and now is all you have. So with that, forget the fear of that concept and think about the opportunity of it. Turn the fear into opportunity and say, I've got a moment here, a chance to contribute to this ever vast perpetually changing, evolving world full of human beings. So, social act, creative act. Design is also a political act. Design is also an economic act. If you design something like the Eiffel Tower, the French get 26 million visitors a year to look at that rusted, Steel thing. Seriously. I like history in that regard. I can go back to, if I go to the Vatican, I can go to the pyramids. And I'm in awe because it's amazing that 3,000 years ago the pyramids were built, etc. And I can appreciate it. But today, I want to see those landmarks, those icons of now. Because when I told you the Eiffel Tower in 19, whatever, 43, whatever you did, that was then. And that, by the way, was the latest, latest technology. I just finished a small, very inexpensive, modular housing um, a building in New York, Harlem. And the neighborhood went holistic when they saw the renderings of the building because the neighborhood is all brown, what they call brownstones in it. You know, the kind of townhouses with brown bricks. They were all set. That's all the buildings in Canada. And this happens, by the way, in many parts of the world. Now, the area is not landmarked, so it's not like I'm breaking the law. I'm putting these shields and shields whenever you want. And why did the neighbors get so upset? First of all, the facade of the building freaked them out. <laughs> Think about this. Your eye can see 16,000 different colors. Isn't that amazing? Color is a beautiful visual phenomenon. It can change the mood, the emotion of somebody like that. If this whole era, this stadium right now, or this uh, theater, was to say yellow, it would be a different impression of my lecture. It's amazing. Luis uh, Barragan, this Mexican architect, for example, who did things he did in color, beautiful. Some places on Earth love color. You know who loves color? The closer you are to the equator, which is my conclusion for a lot of years, Observation, color is celebrated. Chile, Ecuador, you go around. The bit the further you go away, the more monochromatic the world. <coughs> Next thing you know, you're way up in north of Norway, or you're in Canada, or in Russia, and there's no color to be seen anywhere. Do you think it should be the opposite? I was thinking about this. Because the agriculture, the vegetation of the equator is full of flowers and colors and richness of nature, full, the sky, everything, right? The water, the beaches. So then maybe everything you build should be monochromatic and it should flip. 
So if I'm in northern Canada and I'm, I go to Alaska, I love to see a nice bright pink building. Seriously, because it's so depressing. Anyway, pink wasn't really the issue. That building could have been electric blue, it could have been fluorescent yellow, whatever. It got very upset with color. So there's a big petition. 1,600 people wanted to build to color change. So I thought of a strategy. This is, this is design. I made four renderings of the same building, four other colorways of the way I would like to see it. Instead of running, turning quickly and turning it into brown to imitate the brown brick, it would fit in. I mean, it's very strange this idea of fitting in. It's strange that when I was 19, that my penmanship had to be like every architect and designer just wanted. Strange, I had to draw and sketch. I was taught to sketch to be like everybody else in the class. We all had to draw the same. Uh, wait a second, are we in a creative profession here? Are we individuals? When you look at the history of architecture, it's quite interesting. Look back at the 19th century. The amount of Bauhausian architecture that was done around the world was basically a formula. The architect was providing a service. Oh, I, I have a round window, I have a curve here, blah, blah, blah. There was no creativity. We're, we're like making a, robots in, the, in creative professions. So I gave them four colors of the facades. Of course, one was all white, and I knew they'd pick the white one. Because it was the safest, but yet, all white on the street of dark brown brick will look fantastic, right? And then I did something a little subversive. I put underneath the balcony fluorescent pink. <laughs> so in the rendering it was white, but wait till the building's built. Because well, the light will bounce the pink. And the balconies that have white glass, all white glass will be nice, will glow pink. Fuck them. Oh. <laughs> anyway, uh, so next part is I'm a little tired, I'm jet lagged. So Designs of social life. Designs of creative effort. Economic. 26 million people visiting the Eiffel Tower. Why on earth? And by the way, I want to say, Singapore has some beautiful buildings here. So they understand, they get that idea. To build some radical new things that have to do with the time in which we live, that have our mirror, that echo this moment in which we live. When I do interiors, I do very simple things. I do a lot of very inexpensive. That staircase is just wallpaper, for example. But it's powerful. Because a lot of these fabrics and materials and lines and things I do speak to me. At least this is my way of talking about the world in which I live. The world in which I live is data driven. If I could put some glasses on right now, what would I see here that could pick up data? Wouldn't it be amazing? Because the data is running through all of us. Because we have 160, 160, 1600 satellites around the world. We're wired. There's no on-off. The whole world is just buzzing with information. So I put the glasses on. I'll call my glasses infosthetic glasses. The aesthetics of information. What is that, the aesthetics of information? Is there an aesthetic of information? I don't I think there is one because I'm doing it. But that's just my contribution of what I think. Plus, I'm sitting there on the plane, bored out of my mind. So you know what I do? On my laptop, the last 20 years, I did a book with Tashin that I released about 10 years ago. I have done four or five or 6,000 different patterns with these basic Photoshop illustrations, basic programs we all know, just to see what I can do. Just like a painter could grab a bunch of oil and start throwing it like Pollock on a canvas to see what he can get. Why not? It's my tool. It's my, as I mentioned this yesterday, it is my loom of today. The loom that created plaid, 14th century, was the technology of the 14th century. So plaid, you've got a plaid shirt on, right? Basically that pattern is more or less a derivative, a copy of a copy of a copy of the 14th century. Sort out tonight. <laughs> Go get yourself a digitally printed shirt. So, 
The point being is I make this search for me to speak about a world of ornamentation, an, an anti-adult loose manifesto. Ornamentation is not a crime. Ornamentation is a necessity of human life. Depth, texture, color, feeling. We need these things. We need an aesthetic world, and humanity was obsessed with aesthetics going back 10,000 years. We decorated ourselves, we created costumes, we created uniforms of ritual, and if you look at tribes going to the back, they're aesthetically beautiful. The colors, the clothing, the meaning, and it all had meaning. It wasn't superficial. You paint three lines, and three lines had meaning. It had relationships and meaning. So I'm trying to find some meaning. Going back to the economic gap. Design in the 1980s. If I went into a company and I said, hey, I'd like to design something for you. Big, big company, huge company. Produces some ugly humidifier. I, I could make that humidifier much nicer, much better. I'd even get into the components to see if I can reconfigure them and do something. I don't know. And the humidifier should be completely flat against the wall, square, and there'll just be air coming out or something. So it doesn't have to protrude into the room. Whatever. Right? Lots of like ideas one can have. And they all just rolled their eyes most of the time and never hired me. Thought I was crazy. And produced awful stuff. In the 1960s and 1970s, Sony had a huge, almost monopoly on, I'm sorry, late 70s, on uh, wireless uh, telephones. No one else was producing them, and they were producing garbage. And successfully, because there was no competition, now we live in a different world, a famous world, global competition is so rigorous out there. It's incredible, actually. If you don't innovate, if you don't embrace design, because design, you could argue, is the only brand differentiator, you're dead. Design or die. That's my new book coming out soon. <laughs> Nobody wants to publish it, though, so I'll just put it on, online. Anyway, so no question in design. It is a commercial field. And one has to understand that it's a commercial field. And one must understand when I talk about a social act is, is that you need to be a little selfless to be a good designer. Because you have to think about others. Not just your idea. You can't be stubborn like an artist. You need to think about that maybe if I make a bottle for Pepsi, that they're going to sell 200 million a year, 500 million. Think about that. It's better if it works, it's better if it feel right, it's better if you, you know. I can't just make something artistic. It's not art. Design is not art, it's not a high art. It's really about us. And Tori Sotsnas, who was one of my professors going way back, he said to me that nothing in this world should exist unless it's contributing to a better experience. <coughs> Think about that. That means you could go through the whole world and probably get rid of 60-70% of the built environment. Really contributing. No chair should be produced today if it's not really comfortable. Why we made one million chairs? I'm, I'm just throwing that number out. I don't know how you would calculate the idea of how many chairs have been designed. Because the chair is like the archetype of the ideological model of the archetype, right? They all have to do a chair. But if you're going to do a chair, the given is that it's comfortable. That's a starting point. And I think with the day and age and information that we live with, the given should be that it should be aesthetic. And let's talk about aesthetics. Aesthetics, Greek, etymology, feeling. It's not visual, it's feeling. And feeling 
relates to or is human experience. So you could argue if we want to produce a more aesthetic world, we're producing a more experiential world. The whole world that you walk around in, most of it anyway, was designed in 2D. So when I design a credit card for Citibank, it has to be a rectangle, a Cartesian world we live in, 2D rectangular world. Why? Because there's 1.6 million ATMs in the world that money from. Because I tried everything in my power with them to change the shape of this thing years ago, change the shape of the card without success. Now that ATM machine is a box, it fits into a box, it fits into a grid. I designed a kitchen for a plethora of people. In most of the kitchens, they want to fit in a condominium. To fit in a condominium or apartment, it has to be based on a grid. It has to be based on a grid that the oven suppliers and refrigerator suppliers do, which is a grid. It's a grid and a grid and a grid. It goes on and on, everything's a grid. Think about a mattress. It's a strange idea that the mattress is a rectangle because we're not rectangular. <laughs> you know, it's true. And it's even more strange that a straight line doesn't exist in nature, and yet we produce a Cartesian world. Sharp corners everywhere. Floor meets wall. And the world was designed in 2D because you had a T-square and a triangle, and this is the way they used to be back there. Long before I was born, and you'd like draw with pens, whatever those are, and geometrics. And they would draw a plan, elevation, That's why the world is going to be flat. Today, in the last for last talk, is about this type of creation in 3D. I don't even think. In a nanosecond, everything's changing. That's experience. While you are alive here, that's experience. So if we design in 3D, hopefully we will propagate a more experiential world. 50,000 years ago, or 20,000 years, or 10,000 years, or whatever, when we built a cave, why did we build a cave? Survival. And how did we build it? We didn't make a straight line. The prosthetic tool is this element. This is all we had before we figured out that we could make a sharp, something sharp. So we've done. 
And as we don't, we end up with an amorphous form that we did with, like the extension of the womb. Born in a form like that? I have a form like that. So, we're going to. Because as we make this more three dimensional world, it gives us this heightened experience. The floor will become the wall, and the wall will become the wall. We're seeing evidence of that that didn't help us in the last 10 years. That we're going to shape a much softer, more biomorphic, more extension of the human body. The human body not only doesn't have a straight line either, but like human is symmetrical. And we'll produce this world that you could argue is softer, visually softer, emotionally softer. Physically softer, physically more casual. And the digital age will afford us to live this more seamless, more casual space. And when I say casual, like casualism, meaning I work from home or the office, I wear what I like, I am who I am. No games. No uniform, a transparent world. A seamless, honest, transparent world. That's what I want to see. Thank you. I'm sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are about to begin the question and answer segment. Uh, we invite any of you who have any questions to step forward to the microphones located at the sides of the theater. Let me just say something. I'm a very easygoing guy. You can ask me anything. I mean, I'll answer it. But you can ask me anything. So, don't be shy. Yes. Uh, if the end to choose a city to redesign, which one do you choose and uh, why? If I had to choose a city? A city. What do you mean a city? A city. Oh, a city? Oh, a city to design? To redesign. To redesign? Yeah. How, about, how about I get to start a new one on another planet? <laughs> <laughs> that would be, round up is much easier. Do I have to keep some of the infrastructure? Or do I just tear it down? <laughs> I can tear it down? <laughs> That's a tough one. I, I think it would be one of these cities that is so steeped in, in nostalgia and in, in, in oldness. I don't know what it would be. Maybe Boston. I think that would be a good one. Tear down. <laughs> that's a that's a great question. I like it. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe New York. Manhattan. Manhattan could be redone. Could keep a few of the buildings. In there. Thank you. Okay. Who? Who's next? Yes. Uh, before I begin, I have to compliment you. I met you yesterday. Yeah. I what was the name again, Frank? I yeah. Oh, see, I remember. No, exactly. I can't believe I remember that. I remember why. <laughs> so, 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 before I begin, I'd like to say that you are. Go closer inspired. to the microphone. You are inspired to go to more. Closer? <laughs> don't, be, don't be homophobic. Come closer. <laughs> so, I'd like to say that you are inspired to go to most of the. Students and designers here. Yeah. Indeed, you are a superhero to us, like how the president stated there. And the question that most of the students we think like you are like basically like all rounder. You can do anything, like interior, dark, industrial. Is there something that you can't do? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I don't want to do. 
<laughs> For example, I was asked to design a gun. I refused the project. So, and I, I, um, I don't know actually about that. I think, I think the way my mind thinks is I'm thinking firstly of this idea and this notion of the experience that would take place, how you would interact, et cetera, et cetera. That's just part of, let's say, our existence, which means then there are no boundaries, right? It could be one minute a, a bicycle, or it could be another minute a space. If, if I'm rigorous enough to think about trying to make the best, best experience, and at the same time, there's a lot of other criteria, obviously, smart, technological, innovative. By the way, I didn't mention this earlier, which I really believe in. The design is inseparable, inseparable from innovation. Design doesn't exist. It's not innovating. So uh, that's all connected. World is connected. What? You know, some people are actually just really good at a, a kind of more micro scale, and some people are very good only at a macro scale, and some people I think can cross the boundary. I think. Yeah. And uh, I'm not very good at basketball. <laughs> <laughs> I was a good hockey player. So. Anyway, thank you, Frank, for that question. Very nice. Um, yes. So previously, uh, you look like Johnny Depp from over here. <laughs> previously, you mentioned about originality. Uh, so my question is, what did uh, what do you consider original? Does um, a slight alteration of something that already exists is original or something else? I think if the slight alteration is an improvement, bringing us more, doing something a little bit better, yes. Sure. Why not? Why not? I, you know, you could argue the minute you put pen to paper, you're doing an original act because everybody will never draw. But I think that it need, when I say original, I mean original that will make an impact on the rest of the world. That will have some effect and change. Or somehow steer us in the right direction. And that can be all of us. Thank you. Okay, the, 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 the pausing is starting to. Yeah. I would want after the next part to be like one hand. <laughs> that means I should go. <laughs> okay, next question. Good evening, Kenny. Um, two, two prompt. Do you have any insights into the work of um, the late Sahid Hadid's um, architecture, which I see being similar in not out of the aesthetic sense in terms of futuristic vision or disregarding what came before? Maybe. Um, and do you think the Apple Watch is actually solving or helping us go forward? Let's <laughs> <laughs> Apple Watch. I know, I think it's a good Apple question. Why, why, why not? It's a great question. No? <laughs> okay, the first one, Zaha, <laughs> um, I knew pretty closely for 27 years. And uh, she's an uh, amazing woman. And she not only radicalized and changed architecture, or at least her and her firm, but also she's a woman, and it is a male-dominated profession, and it's a very macho profession. And to do for, for what she did empowers all women now that they can do it too. That they can be architects. They have a huge thing to do that on this. Um, and. The experimentation that took place with the architecture not only is a necessity, but it was fantastic that actually the world embraced it because it is relatively radical work and it was built. It wasn't radical on paper. And I think about that a lot because I'm up against every time I show up and really radical ideas. I, and I'm telling you very frankly, 95% of it never happened. If I kind of do something that's relatively fitting into status quo, and I manage to make like a little twist on it, or make it somehow a little more innovative, or 
something, it happens. The minute I show something quite radical, the difference is, I think that in architecture, there's this space for things that are monumental, like museums and landmarks, which is where the majority of her work went. And that space is there, and it's ex been accepted for hundreds of years. Like the Romans, and the pyramids, etc. The interior of it is interesting. The movie, me, I don't know how many interiors I have, but the minute you try to do radical interior, it's amazing how difficult it is. Somehow, when we become interior, it's this extension of the, the domestic space that we to become very subjective. Like when I find myself in the house, the fear all the time, my color, my form, the clients get really worried. They want to see the wood floor, right? a chromatic. They want to, they want to get their way. It's kind of like the developer doesn't really know how to do architecture, but a client does know what a bed thinks that a bed should be like, or a side table, or a lamp. You know what I mean? So it's much harder, I think, in that window, in that space. It's very really hard to do very simple products. Think about products. I mean, 30 years ago, I was showing, I was, I was working in a design office. And uh, these two partners, Dutch and German, guys, they were quite conservative, and I wasn't. And I walked into the office, and my hair was pink. I was ready to do something you know, interesting. And I got a job with uh, Brita. You know Brita, the filter company? And they were to make humidifiers. So I made these the coolest things. They, honestly, they were very cool. And I showed them all the drawings. I mean, that, that's when I rendered my hand, you know, made everything look hyper real. I showed, and they, Britta, were so frightened of this thing. I almost lost my job. Seriously. And today, you could buy a professional Nikon camera for for us. It's amazing how it changed. So we've accepted in the idea of object to do something that's interesting, unusual, you know, flexible, it's colorful. Architecture also, and in that middle ground, the interior world is really, really steeped in the, steeped in the past. So anyway, about Zaha, uh, you know, much too young to pass away, and an amazing woman, really. And the uh, second question was about the uh, eye watch. <coughs> I've worn an eye watch for one year now, and it has changed my life. You know why? Remember this. First of all, 10 years ago I said in an article, watches are dead. Because I had a mobile phone that was giving me time. I didn't understand why I needed an object on my wrist. And watches are dead. And in fact, the proliferation of all these luxury watches and all these high-end brands, they're hanging on to dear life to keep those markets. The Swiss watch industry plummeted last uh, month, 7% down. Huge impact on their economy. It's interesting, you go to airports and where you see huge shops, just watches. And I know when I walk by them, two years closed. It's over. The watch is over. The mistake of Apple is they shouldn't even call it a watch. It's not a watch. It's my mobile phone on my phone. Or it's what they call, you know, uh, what do they call it? Intel object or a hyper object. It's, a, it's, in, it's technological in dormant. Come up with all kinds of names for it. So it allows me to do amazing things. I, I, I take selfies of myself all over the world by pressing my watch. I put my camera way over there and I press my watch. Boom, 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 right? A little self timer, everything. I look at my watch, my, I don't call the watch. I look at this, my phone, and every hour it's telling me to stand. We're sitting on computers and drawing, and sitting on airplanes, and sitting, and sitting, and sitting, and I keep getting up. Every time I tell you to stand, I get up, I have to pace around an airplane for four minutes, finally allowed me to sit down. So my health really helped my health. I track my running because I'm a runner. And I can go on and on. The amount of things, my whole calendar is here. Right? Like even tonight, it's like it, it's 
vibrated these young late to get uh, in, uh, an interview in Washington telling me off. So it's great. And you know what? The, you know what? It's amazing how it's a great question you asked. You know why it's a great question? Because it's amazing how there's a fear factor. I think the word is uh, a, pr a pronoia, pronoia of technology. On the one hand, we have a smartphone, or we have an iPod with 150 gigabytes of music on, or whatever, videos. We're doing all this stuff, but at the end of the day, we're still afraid. Somehow, there's something, we're skeptical. What are we skeptical about? This object is a passing object for a few years. You're going to be way better. So it's one of those momentary shifting objects that shift the, the product landscape. That's all. I don't know if you remember the Newton. Remember Apple Newton? You know anybody know that? Yeah. <laughs> Apple released a kind of PDA back in 1993 or something. Yeah. Phenomenal. We weren't ready for it. We're ready now for almost anything. And you know what the fear of this is? Very simple. It's on the body. The phone's on the body, right? But this is on the bottom because it's telling me next it will be my tattoo. Next it will be my skin. Next I'll do this with my wrist. Now my skin I see digital time or the date and all that. Next it'll be the chip will go right here. And when the chip is in the iris, as I'm talking to you right now, I can multitask and look at all my problems in my office. <laughs> Or I could maybe watch some pornography over here. Um, <laughs> bad joke, sorry. <laughs> point, point B, that's the fear, right? I think that's the fear of the really embrace. I mean, you know, does Apple not do that well? It's the fear of this embracement. It's like our bodies, inevitably, the technology is going to go inside. And uh, four years ago, the FDA in America approved a chip in your hand to open up all your locks. You know, so you can wave your hand and your door opens and your car door. And I swear, I'm swearing I'm gonna do it and get it. I just haven't got around to it. I'm gonna change all the locks in my entire life so I can just wave my, the back of my hand, the chips there, and doors open. That's, I, I, I have no fear. The worst, Worst trait of humankind is fear. You know what I told my three-year-old daughter? All the monsters and the dragons and the shit out there, they build this incredible fear. You know when kids have nightmares? It's like there's so much stuff to get them frightened. Anything that comes out of Disney, there's some violence in it, there's something frightening, there's some animal or some creature. You know? You know what I tell my daughter? It's pretend it doesn't exist in the world. None of this stuff exists. Santa Claus doesn't exist. All this stuff is pretend. So every she's amazing. Goes to bed and says, Daddy, read me a story about the dragon. I know it's pretend. I love it. She goes to bed, she doesn't have any nightmares. She knows she's consciously understands this idea that it's not reality. And that's kitsch. This world full of kind of kitsch. Rituals, kids' traditions. So, fear, think about that. Think about relationships. What's fear to be afraid of? Death? Inevitable. Why are we afraid of it? Accept it. Some cultures are very good at accepting it, others are, are, have built such phobias. I think if you're 20 years old and you know that you're 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 mortal, I think you'll do something more in this world than to think that you're going to live and you're invincible and forever. So, on that note, I'll take one more question. Okay, so it's a selfish question then, since uh, I'm a selfish artist here in uh, Western Sydney. Um, until tonight, I was thinking I was kind of special being. Uh, Doing Japanese 
Burn my clocks. It's a great term. I can go burn my clocks. I would burn. Okay. No, no. I want to say something. Let me just say it. I'm. This. What I said is to provoke. It's also what I believe. I live my life. Everything I say is my life. Meaning there's no. It seems. I have no fear. My life is innovate. My life is do something original. Every project I sit down, I watch it be something original. Why? Because I want to bring meaning to my existence. While I'm here, I want to do something in this world better for people and to bring some meaning to and feel proud. It's ego too. Feel proud that I put something into the world. So with that said, think about what yeah, think about what you're doing. Because I think what happens with life and with inevitably is we end up in places that we never really ever expected we would be. And for the majority of time, it's not the place we should be. Accept it. What I love about human nature is we're willing to also, how can I say, um, we're positive enough to say, okay, well, you know, I kind of like my job. I mean, I, I wasn't really intending on being a, a, a real estate agent, but, you know, because I studied, uh, you know, fine arts. And stuff. But, you know, I kind of well, yeah, like it. I, and you, 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 in a way, convince yourself that you're in the right place. But maybe you're not in the right place. No. So maybe it was good I came here tonight. <laughs> I'm just telling maybe I said. Maybe. No, no, I was, I did no. my arts and I did Japanese and then I spent 10 years as a Japanese translator thinking that's what I wanted to do. Wow. And Great. then, and then my father almost died. Yeah. And then I thought, right, can't do it back. You know what? I didn't want to do it, so that's why. Oh, so you started out doing Japanese? Wow. No, I did, I did a double degree. I see. Okay. And what did that, what did that have to do with the father? Oh, and then I had a self-realization. Oh, okay. Like, so you thought that I shouldn't be a translator anymore, I should get back to what I really love. Yeah. If you're very passionate about it, and if you're, you really want to put your heart and soul into this, and this world, do it, for sure. At least you have the passion. You know how many people don't have any passion for anything? I'm always kind of amazed at this. <laughs> Seriously! I don't know how, how you exist on this earth with no passion. Passion is the key. I should have mentioned this at the beginning of my talk. The key to actually doing something great. And maybe within that, I don't know much about Japanese block printing, maybe there's something you could do new in it, in your work, from a different perspective or a different angle, and do something kind of interesting or really interesting. And maybe that's what you're working towards. And anyway, I wish you the best, really. Really. Thank you, everybody. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think all of us enjoyed the wonderful lecture tonight. Uh, I would now like to invite Mr. Steve Dixon, President of the South College of the Arts, to present a token of appreciation to Mr. Karim Rashid. Mr. Dixon, please. <coughs> now, the painting titled Squirrel is a special album by Philip Gurevic, a graduate of the South, who obtained his BA in Fine Arts in 2012 and his Master of Fine Arts in 2014.